Well, it's worth, it's worth thinking a little bit more about the impact that animal studies have had on this field. And at the outset, one thought, well, you have a task of memory that we give to humans, so we give the same task to animals, and there we go. It turned out to be much more complicated than that. Because it turned out, it turned out that animals that can learn the task differently than we learn it. So we'll have a task that we learn declaratively, because we tend to be very declarative animals. We tend to memorize when we can. You take the same task, to give it even to a monkey, and the monkey will learn the task differently, using a different brain system. So I'll give you an example of that. Pattern discrimination. Pattern discrimination involves looking at two two-dimensional stimuli, let's say an X and a square and one of them is correct, and your job is to figure out which one is correct. It takes you one trial, and then you remember it. Well, you did it by memorization. You give that test to the monkey, it takes 300 and 400 trials. He learns gradually, whatever that could mean, for a test that involves picking one object for another. And meter temporal lobe lesions don't affect it. The animal is learning it with his basal ganglia as a habit or as a skill. And there's other tasks like that. So the part of the history that sort of gets overlooked sometimes is how hard it was to develop an animal model of human memory. And I, we've said that, well, the key was you have the human patients. We need to understand what structures are important for memory. We're going to have to answer those questions through animal work. So you go to animals and you make an HM lesion and the animal looks good on all kinds of tests. So it was a disaster. And that disaster continued through the 1950s, the 1960s, and the 1970s. There were 20 or 30 years where everybody was completely confused, even to the point where people would say, well, I guess the hippocampus in the monkey works differently than the hippocampus in humans. Not a very satisfying idea when you think about two closely related mammals. And the breakthrough came from, uh, really from Mort Michigan at NIH who developed a task for the monkey that did require declarative memory and that did require the monkey it couldn't get around it. The monkey had to do it in this memorization way. A task called delayed matching the sample, or delayed not matching the sample, where the animal you want me to illustrate with a couple of objects? So in delayed non matched the sample Let's say there's delayed match the sample and there's delayed non match the sample. We're talking now about delayed non matching the sample, which is the task that became the, the, the famous task for the monkey. The trial begins by the animal seeing an object, and the animal displaces it to get a raising reward to, to guarantee that the animal paid attention to the first object. Then the screen comes down, the objects are rearranged, and seconds later, or even minutes later, the animal will be confronted with two objects. And now the animal displaces the novel object to obtain a reward, indicating to the experimenter that he remembers the other object that he'd seen before. And that task turns out to be a task that the animal has to learn declaratively. Because on every trial, a new object is presented. At trial after trial, a different object has to be remembered over a period of a few minutes. And that task is completely is sensitive to hippocampal lesions into medial temporal lobe lesions in the monkey in exactly the same way it's sensitive in humans. There's another task that, that, worked, that turned out exactly the same way. It's a little, it, it's, it's a, there's another task uh, known as concurrent discrimination learning, where the animal or the human has to learn which object is correct for each of eight pairs. So the animal sees these two objects, and this one's correct. And then he sees two more objects, and this one's correct, and so on. There's eight of them, and typically you get 40 trials a day, you get see each object pair five times. If you're a human, you do that by memor you do that by memorization. You just memorize which object is correct for each pair. You give that task to the monkey, you're pretty sure that the monkeys are gonna have to memorize it too. Not true. The monkey does it by habit. The monkey learns it in five hundred trials and hippocampal lesion doesn't touch it. If you make a caudate lesion, then there's a big impairment. So what's interesting then is that this task for monkeys 
is a habit task. So you can turn around and ask the question, well, what if you had a patient who's profoundly impaired and doesn't have, because of medial temporal lobe damage? Could a patient learn that kind of a task like the monkey learns it? Is there a habit system that we have that could be revealed once you took away the capacity for declarative memory? I mean, you never would see it in a, in, a, in a healthy human because they would have memorized this task and taken care of it in one or two sessions. It turns out, though, when you give this task to patients that have large medial temporal lobe lesions, they learn it. It takes them 18 weeks. They get up to 90% correct and they have no idea how they're doing it. They're learning it unconsciously. In fact, in one, patient, one patient said to us, in the middle of perfect performance, said, how am I doing this? And we said, well, because you, you're remembering what you did before? He said, no, no, he says, it, it just goes from here to there. He's talking, you know, you can't talk about a habit. You, you only can express it through performance. It's like a tennis stroke. And that's the best you could do with it. Plus, it's not only unconscious, but it's also inflexible. And the flexibility test for a test like that is the following. You take these eight pairs of objects, 16 objects all together, you put them in the center of the table, and you say, sort them into the correct and incorrect piles. Well, if you just memorize them, I mean, that's, that's practically, it feels like the same task. You just take the correct ones, you put them in one pile. You give that to the patient, he's lost. He said, he didn't even put the same number of objects in each pile and he was 50% correct, it was a chance, flipping a coin to decide where he's gonna put each object. So the task can be acquired as a habit. We prefer to, to learn it as a recollection, but patients can learn it as a habit, and when they do learn it as a habit, they learn unconsciously, outside the medial temporal lobe, and in a rigid kind of a way, that's not really declarative knowledge at all.